Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm just going to course straight through my laptop because last time I realized there's a lot of um, background noise and I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I hope you are kind of getting anything out of the lectures that I'm making about the um, reading the uh, chapters in first aid. So last time we left off at hematology and oncology and we left off at the hereditary thrombophilias. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, continue from there. So let's get started. Uh, we have your hereditary thrombophilias. The most important one here, I would say, is probably the factor V slide, and you're going to get plenty of questions on that uh, with regards to the topic of heme. And the most important thing you need to know about it is that it is due to a mutant factor V. So if you remember, you have protein C and protein S, and protein C and protein S, they work together to uh, prevent, like they are our anticoagulant uh, proteins, and they work on factor V. So if you have a mutant factor V that's not going to be responding to protein C, uh, it's going to go ahead and trigger coagulation in the body. So it's essentially due to a guanine and adenine point mutation. So it looks like this, this ARG506GLN, so it wouldn't hurt to memorize that. Uh, so this is the mutation, and it's become, it becomes resistant to degradation by activated protein C. So our natural anticoagulant methods, the protein C and protein S, um, it's, it's resistant to that. So it's going to go ahead and continue co uh, triggering coagulation within the body. So the real important thing here are just two main buzzwords. You're just going to get a lot of thrombosis all over the body, but you want to think of really weird places as well. So whenever you think of factor V Leiden, you want to see cerebral vein thrombosis, DVT, but also weird places like in the um, portal veins or in the, um, the mesenteric veins, things like that, and recurrent pregnancy loss. That's another buzzword for it as far as the hereditary thrombophilia go. The only other thing that is also important is antithrombin deficiency. Um, so this is, it has no direct effect on PT or PTT or thrombin time, but it diminishes the increase in PTT following standard heparin dosing. So you might get a question where um, you're not going to get the normal increase that you would find uh, with PTT, and that would be antithrombic deficiency. Protein C or S deficiency decreased in, uh, ability to inactivate factors 5 and 8A, increased risk of warfarin-induced skin necrosis, and protein C um, cancels and protein S stops coagulation, so we understand that. There is something you need to be aware of, and I think they'll discuss it later more in the pharmacology section, but we do need to understand what is meant by warfarin-induced skin necrosis and what's going on here. So warfarin, we know, we said it stops the vitamin K um, gamma glutamyl uh, carboxylase reaction. So we need to undergo this reaction uh, in order to activate factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, as well as protein C and S. So you have here your coagulation and your anticoagulation. Here. So both of these are actually going to be inactivated if you use warfarin to block vitamin K, um, this vitamin K dependent enzyme reaction. So what ends up happening though is that this, this goes out first. So you actually have a procoagulant state, a very transient procoagulant state when you give warfarin. And that's what ends up ha causing um, vaso-occlusive problems within the skin and then you're going to get this warfarin skin necrosis, which is why when you give warfarin therapy, you have to give heparin in order to avoid this. So that's something to keep in mind. Let's see what else they have here. They have blood transfusion therapy. So what's important? We have packed RBCs. So when do I give packed RBCs in the case of acute blood loss and severe anemia? That makes sense. When do I give platelets to stop significant bleeding? Fresh frozen plasma and plasma concentrate. It would help to just memorize what are the differences here. So you have both of these are going to increase the coagulation factor levels. So these are very concentrated. They have the coagulation factor levels. So I would use it for the case of immediate anticoagulation reversal. Cryoprecipitate contains very specific fibrinogen factor 8, factor 13, von Willebrand factor, and fibronectin. fibronectin. Uh, leukemia versus lymphoma. Now we're in the section that I hate personally, um, but we have to get through it. And the only way to memorize this is literally to just go over it several times so you remember the most important differences and the translocations and whether or not there's splenomegaly, whether or not there is lymph node involvement, whether or not um, there is a specific treatment that is uh, like very specific to it, like vitamin A, for example. So we're going to go through that. So you have leukemia and you have lymphoma. So leukemia is, is a lymphoid neoplasm with widespread, widespread involvement of the bone marrow. The tumor cells are usually found in the peripheral blood. So that's the point. So leukemia is in the blood and lymphoma are directly involving the lymph nodes. So two important lymphomas, uh, one way we differentiate lymphomas is Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's lymphoma here. So Hodgkin's lymphoma is the one that you may have rem remembered from um, patho 
morphology is it has the Reed Sternberg cells. So you have these owl eye looking appearance to these uh, cells. So that's a characteristic, uh, that's a very characteristic classic mnemonic cell type for Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if you are dealing with a lymphoma and you do a biopsy and you, the first thing you look for is Reed Sternberg cell. If it's there, it's Hodgkin's and we, you continue to treat it as Hodgkin's. Otherwise, it's not Hodgkin's and you want to figure out what kind of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma it is. So all of these Hodgkin's lymphomas, they have what's known as B symptoms. So these B symptoms include, you're going to see a clinical vignette as a low-grade fever, as night sweats, as weight loss. So those are uh, key buzzwords for someone going through B symptoms. So you want to think of lymphomas in that case. Hodgkin's lymphoma is localized single group of nodes with contiguous spread. So this is very important because you'll see with Hodgkin's lymphoma, like if you're dealing with... Uh, lymphoma around the uh, the lungs, for example, you'd see that it would start off in one place and it'll go here and then it'll go up and then it'll cross. So then it has this, it has a very predictable pattern of the lymph node involvement. On the other hand, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It doesn't really have that. It has multiple lymph nodes are involved. Extranodal involvement is common and it's non contagious spread. So it can spread to any lymph node. There's no specific predilection in one area and then skipping to another area, things like that. It's just which is part of the reason why it's part, it has a worse prognosis. Um, the next part is, a, is the distribution. So bimodal distribution for Hodgkin's lymphoma, young adult or more than so, either the very young or very old. Uh, it is important to know that you have an association with Epstein Barr virus. It's really important because there's other um, viruses as well that are associated with other kinds of lymphomas. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind which one Epstein Barr is for Hodgkin lymphoma. You may find it with. Um, um, what was it called, Burkitt lymphoma as well. So you need to be aware, you might get asked questions like that. Let's get on to the, the more specific aspects of Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it contains this Reed Sternberg cell that we said here. So you have your owl eye uh, appearance. So if you're going to do biopsy, like we said, you're going to look for the Reed Sternberg cell. If they have it, it's Hodgkin lymphoma. If they don't have it, it's not Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, Reed Sternberg cell are CD15, CD30, and B cell origin. So the key way to remember any of this right now is to remember that B cells tend to have any number that's more than 10, that's the best way to remember it. Whereas T cell lymphomas are going to have any CD value that is less than 10. Uh, so that's one way that I remember it. So if I get a case of a child who has lymph node uh, enlargement on a chest x ray and you did a biopsy and you see TDT positive and you see CD3, 4, 5, any number less than 10, I know I'm dealing with a T cell lymphoma. On the other hand, anything above 10 is going to be. Uh, B, B cells. That's the best way to remember that. There's different types of Hodgkin's lymphoma. The most important to remember is that nod nodular sclerosis is the most common. The one with the best prognosis is lymphocyte rich. So they have here for you a good way to remember it. Like the best prognosis, the rich have better bank accounts. That's one way to remember it. Mixed cellularity is a pseudophilia. If you remember from our previous video, uh, you want to know what are the causes of pseudophilia. We said parasites, we said allergies, we said asthma. We said certain types of lymphomas or leukemias like CLL and Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example. You have lymphocyte depleted, that's the worst prognosis. Now we're going to look at the non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So these are a variety of them, and some of them are B cells. The majority are B cells, and very few are T cells. You can just start with T cells right away so that we can get rid of this right now. So adult T cell lymphoma and mycosis fungoides. So adult T cell lymphoma occurs in adults. Again, you want to know what viruses are associated with what, and the only way to do this is to consistently review it so you can memorize um, which viruses and which translocations, like we said. So this is associated with HTLV. I have not yet seen a single question yet uh, in the Q-banks regarding adult T-cell lymphoma. Um, adults that present with cutaneous lesions, so T-cells, you want to think of skin. So whenever you have a lesion involving the skin, you want to immediately think of T-cells. Um, so they are cutaneous lesions, and mycosis, fungoides, and Cesare syndrome is also a skin lesion with with uh, Poitrier's microabscesses. Um, that's what is important here. So you have lytic lesions that cause hypercalcemia, then you have mycosis, fungoides. Uh, this is also T-cell lymphoma, and you have skin patches and plaques. So it's a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma characterized by atypical CD4 cells. With intraepidermal neoplastic cell aggregates, uh, Poitrier's abscesses, microabscesses, may progress to Cesare syndrome, which is T cell leukemia. That's all you need to remember for T cell. We said skin, and we said adults mostly, and um, HTLV and microabscesses. Those are the buzzwords that you need for that. Then you have Burkitt's, uh, now we move on to the B cell lymphoma. So you have here um, Burkitt lymphoma. 
Uh, Mercate lymphoma is probably, I'll, I'll probably just put stars against the ones that you really, really need to be aware of. So I would say that definitely know at least the first three so that you don't get confused. Uh, there's plenty of questions on these three, very few on these guys over here. So you have Mercate lymphoma and you have an adolescent or young adult. Important buzzwords here are going to be that you are dealing with an African child. So it's important to know that Mercate lymphoma is either endemic or... Um, so you have endemic form or sporadic form. So it's either endemic or it's sporadic. The endemic form, you want to think of an African child. And if it's endemic, you also want to think of Epstein-Barr virus. So again, this is another example. We said EBV with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and now we see it again with Burkitt lymphoma. Um, so let's see the translocation here. So the translocation is 814. I remember it the same way everyone else does. It's uh, You want to think of it as Burkitt's lymphoma. So when you remember the name Burkitt, Burke 8 lymphoma, uh, and that's due to a CMYC translocation with heavy chain IG14 uh, on chromosome number 14. So you're dealing with a translocation on chromosome 8 and 14. So a lot of these are going to be intermixed. You really want to remember it because you're going to have 14 here for follicular lymphoma, 14, uh, 18, and um, mantle cell lymphoma is 11 and 14. So a good way to uh, keep everything in mind that they all are going to have 14. So let me just highlight that in a different color so that you uh, can see that. So 14 here, 14 there, and 14 there. And now we have uh, 11. So we have 8, 18, 11, 14. I think 11, that's it, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Um, so we said 814, you have a couple of things you do need to know for Burkitt lymphoma. You have star sky appearance, that's important, and in your star sky appearance, you have lymphocytes, sheets of lymphocytes, that's a really important buzzword. You see a clinical vignette, you did a pathology, and it says sheets of lymphocytes with interspersed tendril body macrophages. So you're either going to get a question that says, uh, that says these buzzwords, the star sky appearance, or they'll tell you if you took a biopsy, what would you see? And one of the options should, should say sheets of lymphocytes, that's important. Or you might get a picture of a, of a biopsy and they'll point towards something on there uh, that, that are these macrophages. And they'll tell you, what is this? What are these tendril bodies that the arrow is probably pointing at? So you want to know that those are macrophages. So that's important. So let's take a quick look here. So that's A, if you get a picture like this, those are the, way, the ways you can be asked about Burkitt lymphoma. Um, and that's important to, to memorize as well. Uh, typically, you're going to get a jaw lesion in an African child um, in the endemic African form, or pelvis or abdomen uh, lesion in the sporadic form. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is important to know because it is the most common type of Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And it's due to BCL2 and BCL6 mutation. Follicular lymphoma, so this guy is the most common. Follicular lymphoma is T1418 translocation. Also, it's BCL2. It's important to know with regards to the genetics what's going on with CMYC and BCL2 and cyclin D1. Uh, what does that mean exactly? And we'll get through that. So, follicular lymphoma, it's an indolent course. You're going to have the key word for follicular lymphoma is waxing and waning. You're literally going to have a case of a person complaining that she's. She's having, she's sensing that her lymph nodes are enlarged and then it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away. So that's what's meant by waxing and waning indolent course with painless uh, lymphadenopathy, painless lymphadenopathy. So BCL2 here, they tell you that it inhibits apoptosis. So in case you get a uh, question about what's going on here, BCL2, uh, as it says, it inhibits apoptosis. You have next your mantle cell lymphoma. Mantle cell, there's some buzzwords here that it is uh, higher predilection towards adult males, and it's in the T1114 translocation, cyclin D1. So one way for, that I remember it is that it prevents passage of the G phase to the S phase in the cell cycle. Okay, so cell cycle is being stopped because we have a translocation that's affecting cyclin D1. That's how I remember mantle cell lymphoma. It's very aggressive. Um, those are the buzzwords you need to know for that. Next is marginal zone lymphoma. Again, adults, T11 and 18. So we have 11 again here. Um, associated with chronic inflammation, Sjogren's syndrome, chronic gastritis. Again, I've never seen a question on marginal zone lymphoma before. Primary central nervous system lymphoma. The keyword here is that if time bar related and HIV AIDS, it is important to know that this is associated with, as considered as an AIDS defining illness. 
and we just went through the lymphomas. Okay, so we can uh, go through it again very briefly because I think it's just helpful uh, to know the, the, the translocations and the genetics involved because this is where a lot of questions can come out of here. Um, and you need to really be aware of the numbers, the translocations, what these translocations are doing, as well as the comments here where they mention things on biopsy that they would need you to point at or what you are looking at. You might you might need to just be able to identify it from um, a biopsy. So Burkitt lymphoma, we said Burkitt lymphoma is Burk 8 lymphoma. So that means we're dealing with an 814 translocation, right? And we said the buzzwords are gonna be sorry sky appearance, sheets of lymphocytes, right, and tingle body macrophages in an African child with Epstein-Barr virus association. So there we go. You have diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We said that that is the most common one, and that's going to be due to BCL2, which inhibits apoptosis. And then we said it's, uh, yeah, that's all we said about it. Then we have follicular lymphoma. For follicular lymphoma, the number is going to be 14 and 18 translocation. Also BCL2, so that's also going to inhibit apoptosis. We said for follicular lymphoma, I want to remember that it's a waxing and waning pathology, so it comes and goes in lymphadenopathy that is painless. Then we said mantle cell lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma, we said, is going to be 11 and 14. It affects men mostly. It's uh, cyclin D1. So cyclin D1 is what's affected here, so that's going to prevent G from, to go from D to S in the cell cycle. And that's all you need to know for those guys. You said T cell focus on that if you get a case of skin and if they ask you what type of markers you're going to get remember we said t-cell is anything that is uh, less than 10. so here in this picture here so you have here you have your Burkitt lymphoma right you your tingle body macrophages you have sheets it looks like a starry sky appearance starry sky appearance and you have a child right in the endemic form with a lesion in the jaw next is your plasma cell discrease Yes, I can't even say that. Um, so these are monoclonal immunoglobulin paraprotein overproduction due to a plasma cell disorder. So you guys remember you have your plasma cells, which looks kind of like this. Remember that their function is just to make IgGs, right? So if they start to go crazy, they're just going to keep on secreting a whole bunch of immunoglobulins in the body. So to understand what's happening, right, you're going to have proteins being precipitated all over the body. So one such complication is going to be amyloidosis. And they're going to fill up the bone marrow, so that's going to cause issues right there. And just because these are immunoglobulins doesn't mean they are effective or functioning properly. So you're actually going to have pieces of infection. So you want to keep in mind some of these uh, clinical, these in your clinical vignette. So labs, how do we diagnose the plasma cell problems? You have SPEP or UPEP. So we can look for, we can do an electrophoresis on the serum, on a serum sample or in the urine to detect these white chains. And if you do, you're going to end up finding this M spike, this classic M spike. So it's important for you to know M spike, your brain should automatically jump to one of these two, multiple myeloma or multiple strong macroglobinemia. Um, all right. So Multiple myeloma, you have an overproduction of what IgG, so it's important to know the difference because you need to be able to differentiate this between Waldenstrom macroglobinemia. So multiple myeloma is increased in IgG and Waldenstrom macroglobinemia is IgM. So automatically you might be able to tell right away that there is key differences because of this IgM. Remember IgM is huge, it's like a pentamer, it's five, so it's really really large compared to IgG. Uh, IgG over here, so it's very small. So you're going to have a lot of features of hyperviscosity syndrome with Waldenstrom macroglobinemia. So if you have a clinical vignette that focuses more on headache, blurry vision, renal phenomena, retinal hemorrhages, you want to think Waldenstrom macroglobinemia. So it's clinical features. Again, you're going to see um, uh, bone marrow analysis is going to show more than 10% lymphocytes. So again, you're going to see that also with the uh, with multiple myeloma, so bone marrow analysis also shows 10% monoclonal uh, plasma cells. So the important thing to be aware of is some of the, you might, it might come down to just the clinical vignette and what this patient is experiencing. So if I'm getting a patient who's experiencing hyperviscosity and no characteristics of the crab features here, which we'll discuss, you might be dealing with low and strong macroglobinemia. Let's see what else it says here. It's mostly IgM and its complications are thrombosis. So that's all you need to know about this one is IgM. Uh, multiple myeloma, again, so don't confuse that because you might think multiple myeloma, MMM, no, a multiple myeloma is G, IgG. So you're going to have features of CRAB, hypercalcemia, renal involvement, anemia, and bone lytic lesions. So this is very important, especially the hypercalcemia might be, get features of that patient who's having kidney stone or kidney involvement in some way, as well as the anemia. Peripheral blood smear, smear shows were low formation. You might get a very weird, like I've seen a couple of questions on UWorld where the only thing they're giving me is a 
peripheral blood smear and all I'm seeing is the Rouleau formation. They're just giving me a patient. He's got a history of kidney stones and this is what his blood sample shows, his peripheral blood smear shows and all I'm seeing is the Rouleau formation. I'm supposed to guess based on that that he has multiple myeloma. So that's important to know you have the Rouleau formation here. The urine analysis is going to show Ben Jones proteinuria uh, with negative urine dipstick. The bone marrow analysis is going to show 10% monoclonal plasma cells and intracytoplasmic inclusions, including IgG. One such complication is infection risk and increased risk of amyloidosis. So remember, you have these proteins. So amyloidosis is a protein pathology. And then you have infection risk, as I've said. You have your um, these immunoglobulins, right? You want to think like, okay, wow, I have a lot of immunoglobulins in my body. I should be, you know, really resistant to infection. And, you know, that's great. But actually, these immunoglobulins are not functioning. They're just a lot. They're not functioning at all. So you're actually have an increased risk of infection. Now, the next question you should ask yourself, well, what do I do here? I see that between all of these, I have a more than 10% monoclonal plasma cells, right? What do I do if I have less than 10% monoclonal plasma cells? So if you get a case that looks like it's multiple myeloma, right? Um, and it's uh, and you do a bone marrow analysis and you find less than 10% monoclonal plasma analysis, you want to, less than 10% monoclonal plasma cells, you want to think of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So it can be an overproduction of any type of IgG, usually asymptomatic. There's no CRAB findings. Remember, CRAB is for the multiple myeloma. And then you have bone marrow analysis that shows less than 10%. So basically, you'll get a clinical picture of something that looks very similar to either Waldenstrom or multiple myeloma without the crab findings, of course. Um, but the only thing you'd be getting in your clinical vignette is that less than 10%. So let's take a look here. Here are these lytic lesions that you're going to get uh, with multiple myeloma. Here is the Rouleau formation that you're also going to get with multiple myeloma. And these are the plasma cells that you're going to see in the bone marrow. So if it's less than 10%, we're dealing with MGUS, which is short for multiple gammopathy of undetermined significance. If it's more than 10%, we're dealing with either uh, multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom. And then you want to do an SPEP or EPEP, or uh, UPEP, sorry. Um, and then you figure out what type of IG, uh, immunoglobulin are you dealing with. You're dealing with immunoglobulin G, then it's going to be multiple myeloma. If you're dealing with immunoglobulin M, it's going to be well and strong. And you want to uh, maybe like sometimes by like making sure that the letters don't mix. So G doesn't match with G and M doesn't match with M. So you don't forget that. Next is your myelitis blastic syndrome. So these are stem cells that are involving an effective hematopoiesis. So you have defects in cell maturation, bone marrow blast less than 10% versus AML, which is more than 20%. I've never seen a single question on myelitis blastic syndrome. Um, so the we can skip over that. Next is your leukemias. So these are going to be seen at the peripheral uh, blood level. And these are undifferentiated, uh, unregulated growth and differentiation of white blood cells in the bone marrow. So that's going to cause bone marrow failure and that's going to cause anemia. So with leukemias, you're going to have issues with all three cell lines, okay? So you're going to have decreased white blood cells because the bone marrow has a bone marrow failure. So it looks like it's aplastic anemia. And then you're going to have decreased mature white blood cells, so you're going to have increased risk of infections. And then you're going to have decreased platelets, so you're going to have hemorrhaging. It usually presents, so if you do a sample, so the difference now is that if you did a, a um, if you looked at a, a sample of blood, you're going to find elevated YBC. So that's going to help you differentiate this from um, aplastic anemia, for example, white blood cells, um, because aplastic anemia would have decreased of all cell types but a similar symptoms. So don't confuse symptomatology and jump right away to aplastic anemia, for example. If it was aplastic anemia, you would do peripheral blood smear, and then you would see decrease in all of the uh, cell types. So decreased white blood cells, decreased RBCs, and decreased platelets. But here you're gonna find elevated YBCs, so you're gonna see, you're gonna think of leukemia at that point. So malignant leukocytes in the blood, although some cases present with normal or decreased, so that's also something to be aware of. Um, these cells can also infiltrate the liver, the spleen, the lymph nodes. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. So there's different kinds, and this is also another page, like the lymphoma page, that you need to memorize. You need to know the different translocations, the different markers, the different symptomatology. It may come down to whether or not a clinical vignette has splenomegaly or not, whether or not it has painless uh, lymph nodes involvement or not, whether or not it's a young person or an older person. Uh, so you do need to memorize this really, really well. So let's take a look at ALL and 
CLL. So you have acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This one's in children. This might save you a lot of time if you just remember that this one is in children because you get um, a lot of clinical vignettes and the one that's in children and you narrow it down to ALL might be the only way to answer the, that question. So it's less common in adults. So you get a child, especially someone who has Down syndrome, uh, you want to think of ALL. So this is a little bit confusing to read because it doesn't really tell you clearly that it's mostly a B cell type. Okay, so it's mostly a B-cell type, and it all depends, again, remember, when we said on the type of marker. So if you're going to get any marker more than 10, it's B. Any marker less than 10, it's, it's T-cell. And the reason why I'm telling you to be careful is because you might stick, it might stick in your mind that all of these are B-cell lymphomas, essentially. They're all B-cell or free b cells but it's, um, you do have a type, a subtype of ALL, which is a T-cell origin. And you're going to get a patient who presents with a mediastinal mat mass. They have difficulty breathing uh, or presenting as SVC-like syndrome. And it's gonna, and they're going to tell you, okay, well, you did a sample, and the uh, the markers that you got are TDT positive and CD3 and CD4. Uh, and then you're gonna, if you memorize that all of these are B cell, you're gonna make a mistake and forget that they're actually describing a T cell. Uh, a T cell lymphoma here. So don't forget about this one here. You have a T cell that's important. It's T cell, media cell mass, SBC like syndrome. And if you get the markers for uh, T cell, then it's T cell ALL. It's, it's a special subtype of ALL. So don't forget about that. Peripheral blood smear and bone marrow have increased lymphoblasts. You're going to get the markers of pre. So those are pre-T and pre-B, so that's TDT positive. And CD10 plus marker of pre-B cells. Most responsive to therapy, so that's good. And it can spread to the CNS and testes. So you have two different types of translocations you should be aware of. The one with the best prognosis is 1221. And the one with the worst prognosis is 922, the Philadelphia chromosome. Don't forget that this one you'll also see with CML. So don't rely on memorizing 922 as, a as ALL, because it can also be CML. And most of the questions with 922 are actually at least as far as the clinical vignettes and questions I've seen, most of them that will ask you what translocation are you dealing with, but they are describing a clinical vignette with CML. Next you have CLL, so chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or small lymphocytic lymphoma. So this is an older person, again, older than 60. So we said this one is children. Uh, you're going to have, so this is B cells. So you're going to have everything CD20, CD23, asymptomatic process, slow smudge cells. Okay, so smudge cells, that's a buzzword here. So if you get these cells that looks like they got smudged in the process of being prepared, then you're dealing with ACLL. So that's another buzzword for it. It is associated with a lot of immune, uh, uh, with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So please remember that. That's really important. Uh, you can get a patient who has like very basic B cell symptoms plus uh, features of anemia, right? And then they'll tell you, okay, well, what is it? or what type of anemia is it. So it's like autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and you're going to get, I believe, uh, features, but that kind of looks like hereditary steroidosis, so please don't forget that. So you're going to get spherocytes, um, but you're going to get Coombs positive uh, if you're dealing with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So those are the two buzzwords. So uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia and smudge cells. So crushed little lymphocytes is one way to remember the smudge cells. So what's going on here is a Richter transformation that can occur with um, CLL, SLL transformation into a more aggressive lymphoma, or it can transform to diffuse large V-cell lymphoma. So if you remember from the previous uh, couple of pages, we said that this one is the most common type. It's also the one that we can get a transformation from CLL to DL, uh, diffuse large V-cell lymphoma. So those are the buzzwords for that section. You have hairy cell leukemia. This is also very important. Hairy cell leukemia has very specific uh, buzzwords for it. When I think of an adult male with a B cell tumor and it looks hairy, it's hairy, uh, hair like projections on it. Uh, fuzzy appearing, so you have peripheral lymphadenopathy is uncommon. That's important for you to know. Uh, you're not going to get any lymphadenopathy. You're only going to get something, however, which I believe is massive splenomegaly right there. So you get massive splenomegaly. Uh, hairy cells that stain trap positive and you have pancytopenia because you have a bone marrow fibrosis that's happening and, and dry tap on aspiration. So what are the buzzwords for hairy cell leukemia? We said male, we said it's a B cell tumor, you're going to get hairy cells, you're going to get bone marrow failure, 
and then you're also going to get pancetal pina as a result and it stains trap that's very important uh, that might be the only thing that helps you with your uh, clinical vignette here that it stains trap positive and you have no peripheral lymphadenopathy it is associated with graft mutations that's another thing you might want to highlight next is the myeloid neoplasm so you have aml we have two here you have aml and we have CML and the differences between them you need to be aware of so you don't make any mistakes. So this one is onset 65 years of age. CML, um, if you get someone more close to 85, that might help you with your clinical vignette. AML has very specific findings. You have these ore rods, but most of this comes from something called myeloperoxidase positive. So this the myeloid types have the, my, uh, the myeloperoxidase. So you have the myeloperoxidase positive cells, and then these will precipitate in the cell and form these ore rods. So that looks like this uh, over here. You may use the highlighter. So you have these lines here that you see within the cells. Those are your ore rods, which is due to precipitated um, myeloperoxidase. So they have cytoplasmic inclusions seen there, and then you also have uh, an M3 subtype. We have increased circulating myeloblast and peripheral smear. So the risk factor is previous exposure to alkylating chemotherapy. They might ask you what was what, what caused this patient's AML, and you need to be aware of the risk factors for this uh, in case you get asked about this. So prior exposure to chemotherapy, you get like a patient who had previous ALL as a child, uh, and now they're presenting with what looks like another uh, which what looks like another leukemia, so you're going to automatically assume that it might be AML, right? So that's something you need to be aware of, radiation, uh, Down syndrome again. So again, you have Down syndrome with ALL and Down syndrome with AML. Um, the translocation that you need to be aware of is APL T1517. And the important thing about this translocation is that it, it's an issue with um, vitamin A or retinoic acid with retinoic acid. So we can use Altran's retinoic acid, vitamin A, in its treatment. And therefore, it's actually uh, a kind of a good prognosis because this will help to, to cause, when you when you supplement the vitamin A, you're gonna get um, normal cells being produced, which is gonna induce differentiation of the pro-myelocytes. So all those ones that are undifferentiated, if you bombard it with vitamin A, they're going to differentiate in the normal fashion so you can treat it with vitamin A. So that's very, very good, okay? Um, so that's it for AML. And then last but not least is CML. So CML is just a little bit older than ALL. So the mean age is 64 years. It's defined by a Philadelphia chromosome. So remember, that's 922 BCRABL. And myeloid stem cell proliferation. It presents with dysregulated production of mature and maturing granulocytes. Uh, the important thing is if you get buzzwords, the buzzwords for this are going to be vasopils uh, and splenomegaly. And it may accelerate and transform into AML or ALL, that's blast crisis. And it responds to BCR, ABL, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib. Um, Next are the myeloproliferative disorder uh, neoplasm. So you have polycythemia vera and we have essential thrombocytemia and myelofibrosis. So these are malignant hematopoietic neoplasms with varying impact on white blood cells. So polycythemia vera. Uh, this is one of those things where you learned it either wrong while you're studying for your um, MBBS because I, I used to always think of it as just an RBC uh, problem, right? But actually, all cell lines are going to be affected in true polycythemia vera. So this is something you might need to unlearn uh, in order to answer questions correctly. So this is a disorder of increased white blood cells, and you need to know that it's a JAK stat mutation, so JAK2 mutation. It may present with intense itching after shower called aquagenic pruritus. That's very important. That's a, something you might see in your clinical vignette that helps you know that you're dealing with polycythemia vera. Rare but classic symptom is erythromyalgia, and due to episodic blood clots in the vessels of the extremities, you have increased EPO. This is very important. If it's polycythemia vera, these red blood cells are uh, increasing uh, without any normal uh, stimulus from erythropoietin. So you have erythropoietin is decreased in polycythemia vera. This is different from if you have a case, for example, of a patient who has COPD, right? Uh, and then they are hypoxic. So they have decreased O2. So as a result, they have increased CPO being produced. And then you have increased RBCs. And then that looks like it's polycythemia. 
great. But um, polysophia vera or vera, which is true, the word true in Latin, uh, true is independence of E P O. Okay, so you have decreased EPO versus secondary polycythemia, which presents, presents with endogenous or artificially increased EPO. Treatment is phlebotomy, hydroxyurea, ruxolitinib, which is a jack, uh, jack inhibitor. So you should be aware of the, the name of the drug. Next is essential thrombocythemia, which is characterized by massive proliferation of megakaryocytes and platelets. There are platelets all over the place, and the symptoms therefore include bleeding and thrombosis. Blood smear shows markedly increased number of platelets, which may be large or otherwise abnormally formed. Uh, and then you have, last but not least, the myelofibrosis, where you have atypical megakaryocyte hyperplasia. So what's happening here, to make, to make things very simple, you're going to have megakaryocytes. They're going to secrete TGF-beta, and that TGF-beta is going to cause fibroblasts. So the key word here is fibroblasts. So you get fibroblasts in the bone marrow, they're going to cause fibrosis of the bone marrow. So you're going to have massive splenomegaly because now the, the bone marrow is not working, it's fibrosed, right? And if it is secreting anything, what's going to happen is inside of the bone marrow, right, that's now been fibrosed, Right, as an RBC is being produced and it's trying to squeeze its way out of the uh, bone marrow and to, to enter the peripheral blood, uh, it gets this tear-shaped appearance because it's a very tight area and um, uh, as it's squeezing itself out, uh, it's going to adopt this shape here because it gets injured up through this fibrosis, this heavily fibrosed bone marrow, which we said is due to TGF-beta, which is secreted by the megakaryocytes. We call these uh, teardrop-shaped RBCs, if you remember, dacrocytes. Okay, and I think they have a picture here. Yeah, it's very, very small, but you can see it has this tear-shaped appearance to it. So because you have a fibrosed uh, bone marrow, you have the spleen taking up all the work to try to produce um, the cells for you. So you're going to have massive splenomegaly and teardrop RBCs. So the bone marrow cries because it's fibrosed and you're going to get a dry tap. So polycythemia vera here, so remember this is the true polycythemia, so you're going to have increased RBCs independent of EPO, so EPO should be decreased, but they don't have that here, so don't forget that, you have decreased EPO, and it's important to know the type of mutation, they might ask you JAK2 mutation, which is why they also ask you what type of treatment would you pick, you would pick a JAK inhibitor like ruxolitinib, okay? True polycythemia vera is going to affect the other cell lines, that's important to know as well. So you have increased white blood cells and increased platelets. Essential thrombosthenia, so we're dealing with just platelets. And myelofibrosis, you're going to have decreased RBCs because they're not able to uh, be made properly and on the way out, like we said, they squeeze themselves out of the fibrous bone marrow. Uh, white blood cells and platelets is variable. That's not important right now. And uh, let's see what else is there. CML, decreased white blood cells increased white blood cells, sorry, and uh, increased platelets, Philadelphia chromosome positive, remember Philadelphia chromosome was T, I believe it was 922, what was it 922? Yes, okay good, see, so like I remembered it now, 922, okay, uh, so this is what it looks like, you have this plethoric appearance to their hands, um, here's the fibrose dry tap RBCs, uh, sorry, the dry tap on the bone marrow aspirate, and then here are your tear cells. Uh, a very important thing that you might skip over, please do not skip over this, is to differentiate a leukemoid reaction from chronic myelogenous leukemia. So what is leukemoid reaction? So this is normally what you would have if you have like an infection in your body. You're going to have increased white blood cells, right? So how do I differentiate this from chronic myelogenous leukemia? And I'll tell you right away, if you don't want to waste your time, is to look at your what information they're giving you and you want to look at lab scores. So lab scores are going to be elevated in a leukemoid reaction. Remember, lab is produced by the neutrophils. Right, and the difference the difference between this and CML is CML characteristically has low lap enzymes, so decrease in malignant neutrophils. So that's important. So let's write that in a big red ink here. Lap is what you want to be uh, looking for in your clinical vignette or any information they give you. Is this a leukemoid reaction? Is this a uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia? Do not be confused if they give you a case of a child who has. Um, uh, lymphadenopathy, uh, it, like it enlarged lymph nodes in the neck uh, following an infection. Like, don't think, okay, it's a leukemia or something. Uh, that's not going to happen. Like, that, you have to rule out leukemoid reaction. 
right? Because it could just be normal enlargement of lymph nodes due to uh, the infection that they've just had. So don't be uh, worried about, or don't rush into like automatically increased white blood cells as leukemia. So uh, please do not, do not make that mistake. So you have reactive neutrophilia here for the leukemoid reaction. So it's normal to have elevated neutrophils, uh, white blood cells here uh, in a leukemoid reaction. However, the LAF score is going to be elevated. LAF is going to be decreased with chronic myelogenous leukemia. Some of the findings you're going to uh, you're going to find on biopsy are going to be dolly bodies for the neutrophilia and pseudo pseudopelagrophuet anomaly. And I have no idea how to pronounce this, but I believe in the previous section they did mention what it looks like. Uh, it had to do with a, I remember it's like a duet. So they said it was duet, like double nucleus or something like that, but let's just make sure. Pseudo, pseudo, let's just go through this together here. Pseudo, Helger, duet. Yeah, so it's double. So that's your cell that you're looking at here. You have a double like nucleus. So huet duet. Okay, that's how I remember it. Again, another thing that you need to be aware of is polycythemia. And a lot of the times they will want to know if you know the difference between polycythemia vera and relative. Those are the two questions that I have seen in the question banks. So you have polycythemia vera. Remember we said that you're going to have a large amount of RVCs, right? And you have decreased EPO. That's what's important. So decreased EPO and polycythemia vera due to negative feedback suppressing renal EPO production. That makes sense. But then you have relative, right? So something that looks like polycythemia, but it's not polycythemia. So I know it's not polycythemia because EPO is going to be normal, but plasma volume is decreased. So what does that mean? So say, for example, you took a sample of blood from some... So here's a sample of blood and here's the RBC, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then if you took a sample of blood from a patient who is dehydrated, right? It's going to look like they have more concentrated RBCs, right? So it's not really polycythemia. It's relative polycythemia relative to the fact that they are either dehydrated or that dehydration can come from burns. It can come from excessive use of diuretics. Okay, so that's relative. So you're going to get a question and they're going to be like, oh, look at this very large number of RBCs. And you're going to rush and say it's polycythemia vera. It's not polycythemia. It's relative. You want to look for a patient who has chronic kidney disease, a patient who has heart failure, who's taking di diuretics. Um, if you're dealing with a patient who is a burn victim, a patient who is a homeless person and he might be dehydrated, don't rush. Uh, just because you see some buzzwords, like I rely heavily on buzzwords, but that's actually where they might be able to trick you. Uh, so again, you have relative and you have polyphemia vera. You have, um, you have appropriate absolutes. What does that mean? So appropriate absolutes, so you really do have an increased RBC mass, unlike relative here, there's no, no affection of the RBC's uh, mass or decreased oxygen saturation here. But what's going on here is you have a decreased oxygen saturation, which triggered increased EPO levels, right? Because you have hypoxia triggers EPO, and as a result, you have increased RBC mass. So we call that appropriate absolute. So you can see here that's due to lung diseases like COPD, congenital heart diseases, high altitude. These are all hypoxic states. The hypoxia is going to trigger EPO release, and then you're going to get increased RBC mass as a result. Next is going to be inappropriate absolute. And the key difference now you can tell is going to be the oxygen saturation of inappropriate absolute. So I have elevated RBC mass, I have elevated EPO, but I don't have a natural trigger for it, such as hypoxia, which is the decreased oxygen saturation. So as long as this oxygen saturation in here is, there's no change in it, that's what we call inappropriate absolute. So what does that mean? You want to think of inappropriate, you want to think of inappropriate use or inappropriate drugs uh, or doping is what we call it. So we have inappropriate EPO or blood doping, which some athletes do to increase uh, their RBC mass, uh, which helps them, I think, with uh, their endurance. Uh, or it can be inappropriate EPO due to malignancy. So it could be just red blood cells being increased. And that EPO could be coming from um, a uh, tumor like renal cell carcinoma or hepatocellular carcinoma as part of perineoplastic syndrome. So remember, perineoplastic syndromes are these conditions where um, either an autoimmune reaction is happening to the cancer cells or the cancer cells are secreting something. So in this case, you have these cancer cells are secreting EPO. So you have EPO is increased, you have RBCs are increased, but your oxygen saturation is uh, normal. And that would be inappropriate absolute. So it's not that difficult to understand. 
again here they summarize really nicely for you the chromosomal translocations um, it would be really good for you to memorize these so remember c814 is burke 8 lymphoma 1114 is mantle cell, 1118 is marginal, T4, uh, 1418 is follicular lymphoma, BCL2 activation, remember it's anti apoptotic and then you have 15, 17, 18, L, 922 is seen in both CML and ALL, that's less common with ALL like I've mentioned to you, if you see 922 and you're stuck on it, look at the age and look at the, uh, so look at the age, and most likely if it's 922, it's CML. So an older person, 922, thinks CML. Younger person, 922, would be ALL. Uh, and that's going to be the Philadelphia chromosome that is affected. And the last thing I think is Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So I have yet to see a question on Langerhans. Um, all I remember from Langerhans really is you're going to have a child with bone lesions. And these are like from the skin cells. So you're going to get the primary T cell via antigen presentation. Cells are not are functionally mature. They're not effectively stimulate primary cells. You have cells that express S100 mesodermal origin and CD1A, Burbeck granules. That is the only time that... Um, I think once, and it's a very old question, if you are rushing and you don't want to bother yourself with anger hands, just remember, if you get Burbeck granules, something that looks like a tennis racket, you're dealing with anger hands, histiocytosis, um, let's see, skin rash, recurrent otitis media involving a mastoid bone. I have never seen a question on it so far. Um, I wouldn't spend too much time on that other than for this buzzword here. And the lytic lesions in a child with uh, mastoid lesions, frequent ear infections, outside of media. Um, they might ask you what it has, and S100 would be a very unlucky guess if you were not uh, paying attention to that. But um, again, I don't think it's that important. The tumor lysis syndrome is very important to know. It's also very simple to learn. So you want to think of it as you have a whole bunch of cells. Now these cells can either lice under two conditions. Either you're dealing with a high burden type of tumor, so any one of the lymphomas can have this, or any one of the leukemias can have this, or once I initiate chemotherapy. So either it's within the same nature of the, the tumor cell itself that it has high turnover rate, or um, at the induction of chemotherapy, I'm going to destroy all of these cells, right? So what happens when you do that? You're going to have increased potassium that's being released. And remember, what does potassium do? It causes muscle weakness, and you're going to get arrhythmias. You're going to get decreased calcium, but I'll tell you why that happens. But you get increased phosphate and increased uric acid. The phosphate is going to bind the calcium, so then you're going to get uh, stones, these calcium phosphate crystals, which are going to go to the kidneys and cause kidney injury. The uric acid is also going to cause kidney injury. The low calcium is going to cause seizures and tetany. So remember it like this, increase calcium, increase everything, okay? Increase phosphate, increase uric acid, and decrease calcium. These guys here are going to cause cardiac problems, and these guys here are gonna cause kidney problems. It is considered an oncological emergency. You're gonna get massive tumor cell lysis, and it's often seen with lymphomas and leukemias, or treatment initiation, and it can occur spontaneously with fast-growing cancers. You're going to get release of uh, potassium, you're going to get hyperkalemia, you're going to get release of phosphate, you're going to get hyperphosphatemia, you're going to get hypocalcemia due to calcium being sequestered by that high phosphate, and then you're going to get increased nucleic acid breakdown, and that's going to cause hyperuricemia or acute kidney injury. One way for us to prevent this, right, is to prevent this acute kidney injury, which I can deal with, right, is to give them allopurinol or rasburicase, uh, or aggressive hydration, you want to protect the kidneys. So what's going on with allopurinol? Remember, allopurinol blocks xanthine oxidase, whereas rasburicase is another one that you're going to get asked about. And this guy converts that uric acid into a more soluble thing called allantoin. Allantoin, sorry about the rating. Um, so that it's easily excreted. Again, this is something I've never seen any questions on hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis, systemic overactivation of macrophages. Um, I feel like that's... Uh, okay, bone marrow biopsy shows macrophages, phagocytosis, and bone marrow elements. I've never seen a question on it. I'm only going through the important things because uh, if you just want to pass the exam, so this is why we're here. Next is the pharmacology. So we have heparin. So heparin activates antithrombin. So remember, antithrombin works on factors 2, 8, and 10. So just 2 and 10. 
It has a short half-life, so it's used for immediate coagulation for all the important stuff, you know, pulmonary embolism, I need immediate anticoagulation, um, myocardial infarction, I want immediate anticoagulation, right? So, um, used in pregnancy is one thing that you might get asked about, so you have a pregnant woman, um, and she's worried, and she has a previous history of DVT, for example, what do you use for pregnant women? Heparin. Okay, do not call and say warfarin, because warfarin is teratogenic, as is most things, but warfarin especially. So we give heparin, that's fine. Remember, it monitors PTT, right? So PTT, that is the intrinsic system. We're dealing only with the intrinsic system here, 2 and 10. 2 and 10, intrinsic system, play table tennis. Intrinsic system. Although, or the common pathway, so it's not factor 7. It's not involved here. So what is the adverse effects, right? So if I'm... If I'm preventing coagulation, right, then it makes sense that my adverse effect is going to be bleeding. So how do I reverse that? Using something called cortamine sulfate. And it binds, I believe, because heparin is negatively charged. Um, but we'll check to make sure, so I'm not uh, too confident in that. It has to do with the charge, and it binds to um, heparin, and then it stops its use. It stops its function. Then you have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So this is what's important with HITS. You're not going to get a question on HIT1. You're going to get a question on HIT2. How do I know the difference? HIT1 is very mild drop in platelets. Okay, you get drop platelets, drops, no real symptoms here. Your first two days of heparin administration. It's not clinical, clinically significant. You're not going to even know that it happened unless you're looking for it. Right? It's not immunological. It's transient. There's nothing wrong with HIT, so don't pay attention to this. Okay? Just ignore HIT1. Look at HIT2, though. HIT2, you're going to have an immune pathophysiology that's happening here you're gonna get after five to ten days of given heparin a severe drop in your platelets this is unlike this transient little mild drop in platelets you're gonna get a severe drop in your platelets here uh, and that is due to what antibodies against heparin platelet factor four remember platelet factor four is found in the alpha granules of the platelets what's up can I get video yeah very cool we're almost done uh, here yeah, we're on uh, the medications, the pharmacology. All right. So you have your platelet factor four, which is inside your alpha granules. Don't forget the alpha granules contain the fibronectin and fibrinogen, the platelet, uh, platelet factor four, all the Fs and von Willebrand factor. Don't forget that. So you have antibodies against heparin uh, platelet factor four complex. They're going to get removed by the spleen, and you're going to get a severe drop in platelet count. Highest risk occurs with unfractioned heparin. No, it's low molecular weight heparin, anoxaparin, and deltaparin. Please do not make the mistake when you come to memorize this anoxaparin because you might memorize XA in the anoxaparin as factor 10A inhibitors. Uh, so don't make that mistake, please. Anoxaparin is a low molecular weight heparin that mainly acts on factor XA. They mostly act on factor XA, but it's not direct. Um, factor that's a inhibitor i think um it's a, it's a heparin don't, don't make that mistake it's a fondaparinox which acts only on factor 10a um they have better bioavailability than unfractioned heparin and can be administered subcutaneously without lab monitoring so that's what's important here you can give these new guys without lab monitoring low molecular weight heparin undergo low molecular clearance so be aware to give it to a patient who has renal insufficiency Next is warfarin. So warfarin, we said it inhibits the vitamin K epoxide reductase. You need the reduced form of vitamin K uh, to work in the reaction of the gamma glutamyl reductase reaction. So, uh, it's going to inhibit and compete with, uh, it's going to inhibit this enzyme and it's going to compete with vitamin K. So, you're going to get an inhibition of the gamma carboxylation of the clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So, those are your clotting factors. But you're also going to affect protein C and protein S, which are your anticoagulants, right? Um, if you have, this is sometimes important. I've seen like a couple questions on this where if you have someone who's not responding as well to vitamin uh, to either warfarin, it can be due to two reasons. One, they're either dealing with um, uh, an issue of a drug-to-drug -drug interaction, or they have metabolism being affected by polymorphisms in the gene for vitamin K epoxide reductase complex.
So it's not really interacting uh, in the same way as it would with a normal uh, person who doesn't have that polymorphism. So those are two reasons why warfarin wouldn't be working in a patient. So if you find that their INR is less than two to three, uh, one such reason could be that they are having a drug to drug interaction or simply that they're they're having a polymorphism on the vitamin K peroxide reductase complex, which makes it more resistant to warfarin. So in the laboratory assay, it has effect on the extrinsic pathway, right? So we're dealing with 2.7 here. So one specific way for me to know that uh, monitor warfarin is PT in the extrinsic pathway. So PT due to its long half-life. Clinical use is chronic anticoagulation, right? So I'm thinking of prophylaxis in this case and prevention of stroke from atrial fibrillation. It is not used in pregnant patients because warfarin is going to cross the placenta and it is teratogenic. You want to monitor it using PT or uh, INR. Adverse effects is bleeding, obviously, from giving someone an anticoagulant. Uh, bleeding is one problem. Teratogenic effects, like we've mentioned, skin and tissue necrosis, which is also discussed and drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Uh, anything that is affecting the C. P450 uh, system. So I do want to take a small note about this here uh, and we're just gonna save ourselves some time to show you the CYP450 uh, inducers. There was a um, well, it's a huge huge list honestly. Uh, you can go through it yourselves to figure it out but for the inhibitors um, amiodarone and cimetidine and fluoxetine and grapefruit juice. So for me, I think of the inhibitors as mostly psych, uh, psychiatric drugs, plus, uh, is it plus for Fampin as well? I don't want to make any mistakes here, but um, it, it is worthwhile to know uh, which ones. I did have a small note on this, so let's just take a look at this together. So you have your inhibitors and your inducers. Yep, so rifampin, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, phenytoin. So I want to, uh, like for me, the way I memorize it is that the inducers are mostly like the psych drugs plus rifampin. So all these are mostly psych drugs, right? Plus rifampin, I know I'm dealing with uh, uh, an inducer of that system. So drug to drug interactions can cause these adverse effects. Either they'll increase or they'll decrease the uh, activity of warfarin. Now the initial risk of hypercoagulation with protein C because it has a shorter half-life than factors two and factor 10. So like we've said before, you're gonna be dealing with factor C is gonna be decreased first. So you're gonna have a transient hypercoagulable state uh, and you might wanna cover yourself by giving heparin uh, to prevent any skin necrosis such as the one we see in this picture here. Um, so you have skin necrosis which occurs within the first few days and it's due to small cell uh, small vessel microthrombosis. So heparin bridge is what we do when you start heparin uh, warfarin therapy to avoid that. So heparin's activation of antithrombin enables the anticoagulation during initial transient hypercoagulable state. If they ask you, like, what do you do to avoid this, give heparin, right? Um, for reversal of warfarin, I mean, traditionally you think of vitamin K is what you want to give, but you also want to consider... Uh, the setting that you're dealing with and probably the most likely answer is actually going to be rapid reversal get fresh frozen plasma or pcc uh, because this is going to take some time right you're, you're talking about dealing with the liver uh, uh with regards to its synthetic function so that's something you need to be aware of this will take much longer than just giving rapid reversal uh, and giving those coagulation factors that are uh, not active so one thing you need to know is how to, com to compare the important comparison points so one way is the route of administration Heparin is parenteral and warfarin is given orally. Where does it work? Heparin works on the blood, but warfarin works on the liver. So like we just said, you're dealing with the synthetic function. So um, ideally, uh, in an emergent setting, I wouldn't give vitamin K. You would give like fresh frozen plasma along with the vitamin K as well. So you have onset of action for heparin is within seconds. Warfarin is slow uh, and it's dependent on the half-life of the normal clotting factors. Duration of action is hours. Warfarin lasts longer. We monitor heparin using PTT. We monitor warfarin using PT and INR. Is it cross the placenta? No. So I give heparin for pregnant women. Okay, do not make the mistake and say yes for warfarin. Uh, it is teratogenic. So direct coagulation factor inhibitors. Uh, so we can directly stop certain coagulation factors here. So you have two and you have ten. And ten easily for... Uh, 
us is x, they have the x a uh, so band x right you're stopping x a so you're stopping factor 10 that's one way to remember it and then the way i remember uh, factor 2 or inhibit thrombin thrombin inhibitors are bad so they're bad right um so that's how i i remember it don't, don't have any other way to remember these names because a lot of them are long and complicated so bad is factor 2 inhibitors and anything with x a is going to be uh factor 10 a inhibitors except that one example was it an oxaparin or something like that Yes, and also Karen. Uh, don't make that mistake. It's not direct factor X. It is. I think it is the stem shock. Maybe I'm making a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> but that's how I remember it. Um, so for any of these guys, you're gonna use. It's all the same, really. You're just using a venous thromboembolism prevention of DVT treatments of uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. And uh, the important thing to know is that you can use bad when hit is a problem. So if you're worried about a patient who has previously had hit reaction, uh, and you know that, and you might want to just give them bad uh, or factor thrombin uh, inhibitors. So adverse effects again is the same thing. Like anything you give that's anticoagulant, you want to be aware that bleeding is an adverse reaction. Dabigatrin is the only oral in the class, and I believe Dabigatrin can be uh, inhibited by, or you can undo this effect using, and I'm going to butcher what it's called, but we're going to get to it. Oh, there it is. And Dari Sizumab, I cannot pronounce any of these things here, but um, that's important. So you can reverse, this is the one that you can reverse, the Dari Sizumab uh, for Dabigatrin. Um, for the factor 10A inhibitors, you have bleeding and you can reverse them with adenexin and alpha. It's important to know what you can reverse with what, right? So what do we have so far? We have vitamin K, we can reverse, uh, sorry, you have warfarin, you can reverse that with vitamin K and uh, fresh frozen plasma. You have heparin, which you can reverse with cortamine sulfate. You have the um, XA inhibitors, which you can reverse with adenexin. And dexonet alpha and dexonet. Okay, there we go. And dexonet alpha. And then you have dabigatrin, which can be in, uh, un, uh, reversed using indari season map. Okay. Uh, next is, okay, well, they did that for us here anticoagulant reversal. So heparin with cortamine sulfate. Um, so, yeah, so heparin is negatively charged and protamine sulfate is um, positive. For me to remember that, I'm going to just say, like, because I know, um, well, actually, that's wrong. Never mind. Wait, positive charge peptide that binds to negatively charged heparin. Okay, so heparin negatively charged, protamine sulfate is uh, positively charged. So these are going to bind and you're going to block its effect or reverse its effect. Warfarin, we said, is vitamin K. If you need it slowly, but you want a rapid change, you want to use fresh frozen plasma. Uh, Debbie Gatron said it's adoricizumab. If they ask you, they might tell you, oh, which monoclonal antibody are you gonna that you can use to uh, reverse the effect of this anticoagulant? Uh, you want to know it's a monoclonal antibody. Then you have the direct factor XA inhibitors. So those are the ones that have XA. You want to use andexanet alpha, which is a recombinant modified factor 10A. Antipoiling medications, you have aspirin. We know aspirin works by irreversible blocking of COX enzymes, which decreases thromboxin A2. We use it for uh, decreasing the risk of acute coronary syndrome and decreasing the incidence of strokes. That's important. It's important to know its side effects, gastric ulcers. Uh, and allergic reactions that can happen, especially with people who have nasal polyps and asthma, and then you have renal injury. Uh, clopidogrel, I use that in someone who can't use aspirin. So same as aspirin, dual antipoietic therapy, clopidogrel works on the PDU, ADP and P2Y12 receptor. So let's review very quickly what's going on with the platelets uh, so that we understand the use of drugs. So it's easier for us to um, make the most out of this section. So you have your endothelium, right? And you have an exposed section here of your endothelium. And that exposed section is going to reveal the uh, collagen. So what's going to happen is, I'm going to use different colors here so that um, it's a little bit easier. So that's your collagen. Now you have your von Willebrand factor that's going to attach to uh, this exposed collagen. And then you're going to have a platelet here. And then that platelet has a receptor that's going to bind to the von Willebrand factor. So that's GP1. B. So I'm just going to put one over here. When this binds together, here you're going to have a reaction, uh, which is platelet activation. So you're going to get release of a lot of things. You're going to get ADP, you're going to get calcium, uh, a whole bunch of 
products are going to activate and get a conformational change inside of the platelets. So um, the next step is this ADP uh, P2PY12 reaction. So I'm learning as I go, so I'm just sharing all of this stuff with you guys. So let's just get through this. P2Y12. So one of the reactions, you're going to have your ADP and that's going to trigger uh, P2Y12. So ADP. ADP, uh, and that's going to cause, force the insertion of P2Y12 uh, receptors, which are going to um, cause the insertion of this receptor on the surface called GP2B3A. This receptor is then going to go and bind to fibrinogen which is going to connect another platelet through its GP2B3A receptor and then you're going to get um, this platelet plug that's, that develops so if that makes sense so we have ADP either so we're stopping essentially GP3A uh, GP2B3A receptor um, by blocking this part of the reaction here. When you're dealing with clopidogrel or prasugrel um, or ticagrelor, so it blocks ADP P2Y12 receptor, so you're going to get decrease in ADP induced expression of GP2B3A. So it works same as aspirin uh, for the clinical uses and dual antiplatelet therapy sometimes they're used together. And its side effects is neutropenia, especially with the ticopidine. Um, that's it. So you have abixumab, abixumab. These are so hard to pronounce. <laughs> abixumab and these guys here, the fibs. So fibs work directly on this. So either I am blocking. So let's use red now. So either I'm blocking this using clopidogrel, those guys, or I'm blocking this using the fibs. So I want to remember is like for me, fibs is like. Because the end result is that the GP2B3A is going to bind to fibrinogen. So the FIBs, which are these guys, which we're not going to pronounce, GP2B3A, so these are fibrinogen receptor. Uh, these drugs here are the ones that would use to block that. Uh, what do we use it for? Unstable angina, percutaneous uh, coronary intervention. I haven't seen any questions on any of these guys yet, so thank goodness for that. Um, this thing here, we're not going to pronounce anything. Blocks phosphodiesterase, decreased camp in the platelets. Use an intermittent colloidal ligation and stroke prevention and cardiac stress testing and prevention of coronary stent restenosis. I've never seen any questions on any of these guys, so um, except maybe aspirin and clopidogrel. Those are probably the two that you really want to know. Next is this horrific thing the cancer therapy cell cycle. Okay. Um, how do I approach this? I approach this by these guys first because it's easier. So you have your mitosis, right? Remember when you have your mitosis in your cell, you need these two little things called microtubules to move. First, they need to be formed. Then they need to move to the poles, right? So you're going to get you're going to get two at the poles here so that they can go ahead and release these little filaments to pull the chromosomes apart, right? So these are microtubules inhibitors or your taxanes and your vinca alkaloids. Then all the rest is um, stuff that we're going to learn together right now, okay? So <laughs> you have your nucleotide synthesis. So either I'm blocking nucleotide synthesis, making the nucleotides themselves, or I can affect essentially like cancer therapy tar uh, targets. This is like the best way for me to uh, summarize this for you. This is like the easiest way. So either I can affect cancer therapy from the making of the nucleotides all the way up to cellular division. So nucleotide synthesis, the DNA, and cellular division. So we already mentioned the tubules issue, right? So you have either I'm inhibiting the microtubule formation totally. I'm not making these microtubules. Remember, they look like this. Um, you have these microtubules. I'm inhibiting their formation completely, or I'm inhibiting their disassembly. So they usually come together like little X here. I prevent them from being formed or I for prevent them from disassembling and going to the opposite poles and pulling the cell apart. So that's one way. Others is a nucleotide synthesis. 
or I'm affecting the DNA in some way. So this for me, if this is overwhelming, just stick to this. Uh, and I will tell you so far with regards to questions, where I've seen questions from, and I've seen questions mostly from the Vinca alkaloids or the taxanes, gliomycin. You might get questions on etoposide and tenopicide or the or just to know like which one or these two here. Uh, they know you're going to get confused or you're going to forget the names, uh, which one is topoisomerase 1 and which one is topoisomerase inhibitor, uh, uh, topoisomerase 1 inhibitors. Uh, and then these guys here, the methotrexate and 5-FU and the hydroxyureas. So those are the ones that I've seen questions on. Uh, so it wouldn't hurt to just like familiarize yourself and not be too overwhelmed with it. It's far more important drugs to, to remember right now. So you have Nucleotide synthesis, so you have methotrexate or 5 fluorouracil to use your them pyrimidine synthesis. You have your hydroxyurea, which inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. You might get a question on how it works. You have your DNA, so um, if we're dealing with your DNA, remember you have your DNA it needs to be unzipped. Remember? It needs to be unzipped. So, or you need to, and then you have your uh, polymerase, which comes in and builds it again. Right, uh, so you may be affecting any one of these. So you have alkylating agents or platinum compounds which cross-link the DNA. The cross-linking it means they're preventing it from being separated. So you can't use that template to make more cells. Okay, just think of it like that. Then you have gliomycin, which causes breaks within the DNA strands. So you're not going to have proper DNA. You're not going to have proper RNA. You're not going to have proper cell being developed. Or you have these uh, DNA intercalators where they literally just stick themselves in there. So it prevents uh, the polymerase uh, enzyme machinery from working. Or you have the topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. Then you have the cellular division, which we've already discussed. So we will uh, briefly, very quickly try to get over um, these guys. So you have bleomycin. So we said bleomycin causes breaks within the DNA by causing free radical formation. Adverse effects, pulmonary fibrosis, very important to know. Leomycin affects the lungs causing pulmonary fibrosis. Dactinomycin intercalates into the DNA, right? You may want to draw it if you want to. Um, so let's just draw it to make things easier for us. So you have uh, Leomycin, which breaks the DNA strands. So I'm gonna see if there's a different color. See, so that's bleomycin. He breaks the DNA strands, and you're gonna have pulmonary fibrosis as a side effect. So uh, you'll find that in the next few pages, you're gonna have like a picture. I think they use like the lungs. They draw it out like this. So that's how you know like these letter Bs are bleomycin causing pulmonary fibrosis. Next is dactinomycin, which intercalates into the DNA. So this is just, he's just sitting there, right? He's not gonna let the machinery work so that you can get more DNA and like reproducing that DNA or anything. So you're intercalating into the, the DNA, preventing RNA synthesis. Uh, the one thing about dactinomycin you wanna remember is in the, which tumors that it's uh, used for. Wilms tumor, Ewing sarcoma, and rhabdomycosarcoma. You're not going to remember that. Just remember, these are all children's tumors, right? Wilms tumors in children, Ewing sarcomas in children, or Abdo myosarcoma most commonly is in children. Um, with any of these, actually, you want to always keep in mind that myelosuppression is going to be a side effect. Doxorubicin and danorubicin. So you have these guys, they generate free radicals. They also intercalate. So you have these here uh, that also intercalate within the DNA, causing breaks and decrease replication and inhibit uh, so by summaries too. So you have uh, multiple effects here. So they generate free radicals like bleomycin, they intercalate into the DNA like dactinomycin, and they decrease replication by inhibiting topoi summaries uh, too. So you have like a three in one action here with the anthracyclines. This is used for solid tumors like leukemias and lymphomas. The one thing to remember is this dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, and you'll also see this mentioned in cardiology section that doxorubicin causes uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. The key thing is it's often irreversible and you can prevent it with dexorazosane. I can't say it, dexorazosane. Uh, so that's one thing to remember. So um, I think they also in the picture here, which is really neat. Let's just skip to it. If they have it. Okay, good. So bleomycin here. That's your lungs. Pulmonary fibrosis. Then you have your D for your doxorubicin and danorubicin causing cardiotoxicity and dilated cardiomyopathy.
All right, so next we have your thiopurines. So these are your anti-metabolites, right? You're dealing with uh, like the purines and pyrimidine synthesis levels here. So they decrease uh, purine synthesis. Azothioprine is a pro-drug. So remember, it goes into your body and then it gets converted into an active drug. So it's converted to 6 mercaptopurine, which is then activated by uh, this enzyme, HGPRT. Quick question. Deficiency in HGPRT causes what? Leash 9 hand syndrome, remember? And the key feature of Leash 9 hand syndrome is going to be crystals in the urine. Uh, and because you have hyperuricemia and the key feature is self-mutilation. So don't forget that. Um, HGPRT, then you have its uses are going to be for many things, right? You have rheumatoid arthritis. So it's, if it's useful for you to remember azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine, it's used in rheumatoid arthritis and IBD and SLE and ALL, all of these uh, immunological diseases, prevention of organ rejection and weaning from steroids. Its effects, like we said, for any of these things, you want to always keep myeloid suppression in your background as something that can happen. Uh, six more capipurine is inactivated by xanthine oxidase. That's important. Increased toxicity with l purinol or fibroxystat. Uh, Cladibrine and pentostatin are purine analogs. Uh, they cause inhibition of ADA and DNA strand breaks. It's used in hairy cell leukemia. Remember what we said about hairy cell leukemia. Cells that are hairy, you have pancytopenia, you have staining tract positive, and you have massive splenomegaly, and you have dry tap. So it's good to like make a small little note so you don't forget, or at least when you're reviewing, uh, it's worthwhile to review Harry Sandlokina and make a small note on that right there. Um, Cytarabine. Guys, we're just not going to pronounce any of these things right now. This guy. DNA chain termination inhibits DNA polymerase. I've never seen any question on this. 5 fluorouracil That guy is important. Here we go. 5 fluorouracil 5 fu uh, It prevents thymidylase synthase inhibition, so you're going to get decreased DTMP, so decreased thymidine, right? Used for colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and again, I have not seen anything important except to know that you can uh, enhance its effect with leukocorbin. So that's like this guy here with the, uh, where did he go? Increased toxicity, oh, with this guy, this was increased toxicity. You can increase the effect of uh, 5 fluorouracil with leukocorbin. Myelin suppression, polymer planter, and foot syndrome. That's also another buzzword here. Methotrexate, folic acid analog, also is going to result in the same thing. Like you're going to have decreased uh, DTMP, uh, just as you've had with front floor So I know we've skipped hydroxyurea. So it's used for cancers like leukemias and ALL lymphomas. Choriocarcinoma is important. Methotrexate is used to uh, induce like abortion. Uh, so you have ectopic pregnancy, medical abortion with misoprostol, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriasis, IBD. Methotrexate is worth knowing really well. Methotrexate, hydroxyurea, uh, 5 fluorouracil and azocyprine, and 6 mercaptopurine. Those are the guys I would say to, to focus on. And um, let's see. So you have myelosuppression again. We've seen that. We have leukocorvin, uh, leukoborin, leukoborin rescue uh, because of the folic acid analog. So you can... Uh, I believe it just works by blocking the, uh, or just gives supplies, supplies folic acid, if I'm not sure, but the, I'll get back to that, figuring out what I'm talking about. Hepatotoxicity, mucositis, and pulmonary fibrosis, folate deficiency, ter oh yes, folate deficiency, so teratogenic. Um, and what type of teratogenic thing are you going to be dealing with? Um, spina bifida. Next is your hydroxyurea. You want to know the enzyme, like the nucleotide reductase, decreased DNA synthesis. I don't know if you guys can tell I'm burning out while I'm doing this video. CML, polycythemia vera, used in the treatment of that. So yes, this is a VIP question. Here we go. Uh, polycythemia vera it is used. They'll tell you, what do you use to treat polycythemia vera? Hydroxyurea. Sickle cell disease, because it increases HPF. remember. Uh, HPF is going to have decreased binding to 2,3-BPG. Right, the, or the decrease 2 3 BPG, and then you're going to get, as a result, uh, increased more avid binding to oxygen. So you're going to have a red cell type which is resistant to hypoxia. And if you remember, hypoxia was a trigger for sickling. So you can stop that sickling by giving uh, hydroxyurea. And don't forget, it causes megaloblastic anemia. Okay. 
We're almost there. Oh my god. Okay, we got this. We're gonna keep going. Um, alkylating agents, busulfan. Let's draw our little DNA again. Your busulfan, which cross-links the DNA, so it just stops it from um, separating. Used to ablate the patient bone marrow. That's important. Used to ablate the patient bone marrow before bone marrow transplantation. That's important. You want to ablate the bone marrow so that you don't get a reaction called uh, graft versus host disease. As a result, you're going to have severe myeloid depression. In almost all cases, pulmonary fibrosis. Don't forget that. With busulfan. And hyperpigmentation. There's something I want to check. So BB. Bleomycin. And busulfan. We've got to draw the other B backwards. So you have your lungs here. Both cause the fibrosis, the pulmonary fibrosis. Next is cyclophosphamide, which cross-links your DNA. Um, requires bioactivation by the liver. That's important. Used for solid tumors. SIADH and Fanconi syndrome and hemorrhagic cystitis involve uh, uh, bladder cancer. And you can prevent it with mesla, that's important as well. That's what you want to highlight. Nitrocereas, these are the mustards. Cross-link DNA. The important thing is it cross it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Wow. That's a tongue twister. If it crosses the blood-brain barrier, then I would use it. It makes sense to use it for um, brain tumors. So glioblastoma multiform is uh, one such an example. As a result, you're going to have CNS toxicity as part of the side effects, convulsions, dizziness, and ataxia. Uh, let's move on. Maybe you want to know procarbazine, mechanism unknown, weak malinhibitor, Hodgkin's lymphoma and brain tumors, pulmonary suppression, pulmonary toxicity, disulfuranemic reaction. Platinum compounds or cisplatins, the platins, all the platinum compounds, the platins, they cross link the DNA. They are cell cycle non specific. Adverse effects are the uh, nephrotoxicity. All of this stuff will make sense, at least with regards to the side effects, when you see the end. Uh, diagram, which is pretty useful. Now we get to the microtubule inhibitors. So these are all M phase specific, which makes sense, right? Because during your M phase where you're having that splitting of the cells, right? Uh, that's where your microtubules are doing their work, right? So you have your taxanes, you have your vinca alkaloids. So your taxanes stabilize the microtubules. So remember, they have this X-like appearance. They're crossed together, right? Um, so they stabilize them, so it prevents them from breaking down. So they're not going to go to their poles, they're not going to pull apart the chromosomes and separate the cells. Uh, so we use that for various tumors. So taxanes stabilize society, that's how they have it here. They stabilize the microtubules. The more important ones are the vinca alkaloids, vincristine and vinvelastine. So these guys are going to inhibit the polymerization into microtubules, so they prevent the formation from the first place. You're not going to get them. So the key thing now is to know the side effects. Side effects are vincristine crisps the bone marrow, or crisps the nerves, sorry. Vincristine crisps the nerves. So you're going to get polyneuropathies with vincristine, vinblastine, blasts the bone marrow. Those are the side effects you want to know for uh, vinca alkaloids, vincristine, and vinblastine. So let's see what it says. Vincristine crisps the nerves. You're going to get neurotoxicity, including ileus. And vinblastine blasts the bone marrow. You're going to get myeloma suppression. Now these guys, I cannot mention how many times I've confused these over and over again. So you have irenal tecan. Topotecan. We're going to get through this together. Irenal tecan and topotecan inhibit topoisomerase 1. Etoposide and tenoposide inhibit topoisomerase 2. So they're saying that tecone, see it as like the tecans, as tecones are 1. I've never thought of it like that before. So tecone as 1, 
So I wrote out T-cone and topo T-cone 1, topo isomerous 1, and a topo side and tinopo side, both sides, topo isomerous 2. So I'm going to stick with that. I think that's easier to remember. Um, topo side and tinopo side. Tinipus lua. <laughs> tinipo side. Um, so both sides. Topo isomerous 2. All right, we wasted enough time on that already. Severe myelin suppression, alopecia. Nothing I've seen any questions on, except they want to know if you know which one is which. I've seen enough questions on this to know I hate to hate these groups of drugs right now. So by some race inhibitor, sorry. Tamoxifen. Selective estrogen receptor modulator. This is important because it blocks the binding of estrogen to estrogen receptors in ER positive cells. Therefore, I can use it in the treatment of breast cancer and prevention of gynecomastia. The problem is, is that this is the main problem with endometrial cancer. Because it's selective estrogen receptor modulator. What actually ends up happening is it blocks the estrogen receptor on the breasts. So it's useful for breast cancer, but it stimulates the estrogen receptors on the uterus. So you're going to get endometrial cancer as a risk factor. So uh, don't forget that. Hot flashes increase risk of thrombotic events. Anti-cancer monoclonal antibodies. The only time I think antibodies is actually to, to understand them is in this section here. Because studying them during immunology was very uh, tedious, to say the least. But here at least you can remember some things about them. Uh, and it makes sense to follow them in this way. So here we go. Alemtuzumab. CD52. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia and multiple sclerosis. You get asked alemtuzumab with a multiple sclerosis question in neuro. You're not going to get alemtuzumab anywhere else. They want to know that you can use it in very refractory cases of, alum, of uh, multiple sclerosis. So yes, I've seen questions like that. Uh, increased risk of infections and autoimmunity. Uh, Bivacizumab. Vajep. This guy memorized him because it's uh, pretty simple. He's the weird named one, the only one with B in it. So Vivekizumab, the Jeff. So two things you want to think of. I want to think of tumors that are like fast growing uh, with blood vessels, right? Or if I'm dealing with macular degeneration or angioproliferative retinopathy. Um, for some reason, they will ask you about this because they know you're not going to pay attention to this. Angioproliferative retinopathy. So I can use that. Remember, with the in the, in the retina, uh, if you have like a, a feature of, of hypoxia, that's going to trigger the Jeff secretion, and then the Jeff is going to end up causing blood vessels to grow all over the place, and that's going to cause like ripping of the retina um, off of its attachments. So you're going to get this retinopathy. So one way to prevent that, especially with diabetes, right? So one example of what causes the hypoxia is going to be diabetes. You're going to get increased the Jeff. You're going to get increased blood vessels. You're going to get these blood vessels are going to start pushing on the retina. And then you're going to get um, detachment of the retina. So that's the basis of that. So the Jeff is what we use in treatment for that. Um, I think it's like a direct injection into the eye. So you have the Jeff. Uh, we can use it for colorectal cancer. It's worth knowing. Colorectal cancer, renal cell carcinoma. Uh, and especially angioproliferative retinopathy. You're going to like focus so much on the Zoomabs and Iximabs and all that stuff. And then they'll ask you about the weird ones. I've seen questions on multiple sclerosis for alemtuzumab, and they'll tell you which CD52 blocker targets, which drug targets CD52 used in this patient. And then they just get you out of nowhere, because if you're thinking you're dealing with a neuro question, your brain is focused on neuro, and there is no antibodies that you really use for anything in neuro except for multiple sclerosis, alemtuzumab, CD52, vivacizumab, the Jeff inhibitor, colorectal cancer, renal cell carcinoma, angioproliferative retinopathy. The important thing I did get a question on once is impaired wound healing. So they might ask you, like, you have a patient who's, like, being treated for something. Like, he's got cancer, and he's given the vacuzumab, and he gets a wound, and uh, you suture it, and you come back later to check on it, and it still hasn't healed. What's going on? It's due to the, um, what, what, and they'll ask you, like, what drug did they, were they probably given as chemotherapeutics? Here, then it will be uh, be vacuzumab. So tuximab important EGF or endothelial growth factor it works on that so it works on metastatic colorectal cancer and head and neck cancer late stages like stage four 
EGF4, it's important to know this one. Rituximab, here we go. We've seen Rituximab all over. So Rituximab works on CD20, so it makes sense that we're dealing with the non-Hodgkin lymphomas, CLLs, but also it works on the rheumatoid arthritis, ITP, TTP, AIH, and multiple sclerosis. Again, Rituximab and Alemtuzumab are the weird ones that you can use for multiple sclerosis, typically refractory. Um, refractory um, stages of the disease, and then you have increased risk of PML with patients with JC virus. That's something that you need to highlight. Trastuzumab, part two. This guy works on breast cancer. Side effect is dilated cardiomyopathy. These guys, never seen them, never seen questions on. Do we need to learn them together? Increased autoimmunity, dermatitis, enterocolitis, neuronitis. I've never seen questions on them. I would rather skip them and focus on something more important. Anti-cancer small molecule inhibitors. Oh my god. Here we go. Never seen them. Like I said, like disclaimer. <laughs> I'm only pointing towards things I've seen questions on and I've done enough questions on him to, to know which at least is most important. Um have I seen anything? I've seen imatinib, yes, definitely these guys, uh, for BCRABL, so we use it for the treatment of CML and ALL. That's important. Ruxolithinib is jack, ha uh, jack inhibitor for polycythemia beer, if that makes sense. Never seen any of these guys. You might want to memorize them if you want to. Uh, the RAF ones, yes. Anything with RAF in it is RAF, or something that targets RAF. If you remember, uh, well, it's in melanoma. Uh, well, I haven't made that video yet, um, but yes, because yesterday I was studying musculoskeletal, so BRAF for melanoma, and um, that's it. Okay. Hmm. That's it. I'm not doing any more of this. I've reached my burnout stage. Amelioration of adverse effects of chemotherapy. Finally, something useful, something that you can actually, like, apply. Alright, so... Uh, for the platinum compounds, if you remember the cisplatins, you'll see here in this diagram the C, right? The letter C, cisplatin, carboplatin, cause nephrotoxicity. We can protect the kidneys from these platinum compounds using this drug, which is a free radical scavenger. This dexrazosane is an iron chelator to protect from the anthracyclines, which were the... Uh, the other things that start with D's, which are doxorubicin, for example. So they cause cardiotoxicity, we can treat them using another thing that starts with D, which is dexa dexrazosane. Somebody made a meme once about pharmacological companies or whatever pharmacy companies just grabbing a keyboard and slapping it to make the names of these drugs. It's really hard to pronounce. Like I can't even imagine somebody whose English is not their first language trying to make the most of this. Leuco Vorin is folinic acid, not folic acid, folinic acid. Uh, it's a tetrahydrofolate precursor, so we use it as a rescue if I'm giving a patient methotrexate, remember? And mesna was to protect against the hemorrhagic cystitis from cyclophosphamide. Rasmure case, remember, that's for tumor lysis syndrome, so it converts the uric acid into a lantoin, which you can just pee it out. Odansetron and granny. Uh, I remember this as like Odin, the Norse god, granny, an old lady, if he was a woman. So grandma Odin is a serotonin receptor antagonist. So we use that for acute nausea um, prophylaxis. So on patients who have uh, chemotherapy, um, like vomiting is a problem. So we can use 5-HT3 receptor antagonists uh, to prevent that vomiting. Or you have metclopramide, which is D2. Now, for delayed nausea, you have a prepotent, which I've seen questions on, which is a neurokinase 1 uh, receptor antagonist. Because the difference is this. With the acute uh, nausea, it's at the level of the GIT. So I think the, uh, yes, so I remember now, the GIT secretes serotonin in response to the chemotherapy. So it makes sense for me to use uh, these like serotonin receptor antagonists, especially Odin and Cetron is like the, uh, the, the buzz name to know. 
Um, so serotonin, so I block that serotonin for the acute nausea. However, with the delayed nausea, the nausea is coming from substance P, uh, which is going to trigger the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the brain. So I stop that using the neurokinin receptor antagonist. So it's worth your while to know these names. I prefer to to know them, Cetron or Granny, uh, for the nausea chemotherapy prophylaxis. Um, Pilgastrin is recombinant GMCSF, and Equoleutin alpha is recombinant EPOUs for anemia. Last but not least, yes, thank God. Last but not least is this. I'm going to try and erase some of these so that we can um, just quickly, briefly go over it. So remember, your autotoxicities are going to be caused by your cisplatin and your carboplatin. They're also going to cause your nephrotoxicities, right? Now, in the lungs, you have your bleomycin and you have your... Uh, Mucelfan, which causes pulmonary fibrosis. Your D for your heart, so you have your, your heart here, and there's a little T inside of it. So D is going to be your doxorubicin, which causes your dilated cardiomyopathy, doxorubicin, vanorubicin. And then your T is trastuzumab, which also causes cardiotoxicity. And then you have your CY, which is your cyclophosphamide. Remember, it causes hemorrhagic cystitis. So what do we use to treat that or prevent it? And you have your mesna. Now you have your arms right and legs so your nerves crisp the nerve using um is, a, is the effect of been christine or you blast your bone marrow let's just say that this is the bone marrow you blast your bone marrow using been blasting and that is it ladies and gentlemen thank you for watching me struggle as i go through um as i went through uh I don't even know my name anymore. As we went through um, him, the rest of the scheme, that took a while, I think. Okay, well, less than the other video. So this is a total of three hours and 30 minutes for you to get through him. Um, I hope you guys found this video to be useful. Um, and at the very least, at least we struggled together in getting through this uh, reading and um, I mean, I did the questions, like the way I prepare for these videos is just like I do as many questions as possible so that I know uh, which areas I need to highlight or which areas I need to focus on uh, where I'm seeing the questions are coming from. So I hope that this has kind of helped you or if you followed along, uh, let me know which chapter you'd like me to do next. And I am very, very sorry about the music in the background. Uh, it's probably the only place I can sit down and actually do any of this work. Um, peacefully with like really good internet so we're gonna have to struggle together uh, and hopefully I didn't make too much of a fool of myself uh, burning out in front of you live while doing the oncology section so I will see you guys in the next video and best of luck in your studies